Do you know the rich history of the indigenous people of America spans thousands of years, filled with incredible cultures, resilience, and untold stories? Welcome to our channel, where we explore the fascinating journey of Native American peoples, their traditions, and their enduring legacy. Join us on this enlightening adventure. Part 1. Origins and Early Migration The origins of the indigenous peoples of the Americas trace back to a migration that likely began over 15,000 years ago during the last Ice Age. The migration theory that prevails today is that these early peoples crossed the Bering Land Bridge, Beringia, a strip of land that connected Siberia and Alaska during periods of lower sea levels. As the ice receded, it exposed new routes, allowing humans to follow animal herds across the land and into a new continent. For decades, scholars debated the timing of these migrations, and new archaeological findings continue to refine our understanding of when and how the first Americans arrived. Genetic evidence suggests that these populations diverged from their Siberian ancestors well before they crossed into the Americas, possibly living in Beringia for thousands of years, adapting to the harsh conditions of the Ice Age. Recent studies have even indicated that multiple migrations may have occurred, and that the genetic diversity found among indigenous peoples in South America points to a complex history of settlement and movement. As these early migrants dispersed across the continent, they encountered diverse environments. Coastal routes allowed them to establish early fishing communities, while inland routes led to settlements in areas rich with megafauna like mammoths and mastodons. These animals provided an essential food source for early humans, and archaeological sites, such as those at Monte Verde in Chile and Bluefish Caves in Canada, offer a glimpse into how these peoples lived, hunted, and moved through the landscape. These early migratory peoples were highly adaptable, as evidenced by the variety of tools they used and the diverse ecosystems they inhabited. Though they initially relied on hunting large game, the environment forced them to diversify their subsistence strategies, incorporating fishing, gathering, and small game hunting into their diets. Archaeological remains of finely crafted stone tools, such as spearheads and knives, offer insight into the technological innovations that allowed these early peoples to thrive. Over time, these early populations began to develop their own unique cultures and traditions. Regional differences in tools, burial practices, and settlement patterns indicate the emergence of distinct cultural groups. The genetic and linguistic diversity found among indigenous peoples today speaks to the long, complex history of these early settlers. The origins of the indigenous peoples of the Americas are shrouded in mystery, but ongoing research continues to shed light on their ancient migrations and the rich cultural history they brought with them. Part 2 the Clovis Culture and Early American Settlements The Clovis Culture, which emerged around 13,000 years ago, represents one of the earliest and most widespread cultures in North America. Named after the site near Clovis, New Mexico, where distinctive stone tools were first discovered, the Clovis people were skilled hunters and toolmakers. Their fluted projectile points, made from high-quality stone, were designed to be mounted on spears, making them effective weapons for hunting large game such as mammoths and bison. The discovery of Clovis points across much of North America, from the Great Plains to the East Coast, suggests that this culture spread rapidly. The tools they left behind offer valuable clues about their way of life. In addition to hunting, the Clovis people likely engaged in seasonal gathering of plants and small animals. Archaeological evidence suggests that they lived in small, mobile groups, moving frequently in response to the availability of food and resources. Clovis sites often contain the remains of butchered megafauna, including mammoths and mastodons, indicating that these animals were an important food source. However, as the climate began to warm at the end of the Ice Age, these large animals became extinct, forcing the Clovis people to adapt to new environmental conditions. This period of transition likely led to the development of more regionally distinct cultures as people began to rely more on smaller game, plants, and aquatic resources. The Clovis culture is often viewed as a turning point in the history of indigenous peoples in North America. While the exact reasons for the disappearance of the Clovis culture are not fully understood, 
It is clear that their influence persisted in the form of technological innovations and hunting strategies that were passed down to subsequent generations. The end of the Clovis era marks the beginning of a new phase in indigenous history as different groups adapted to their changing environments and developed new ways of life. Recent discoveries of pre-Clovis sites, such as the Monte Verde site in Chile, have challenged the traditional timeline of human migration into the Americas. These findings suggest that humans may have arrived in the Americas earlier than previously thought and that the Clovis people were not the first inhabitants of the continent. These discoveries have sparked new debates about the origins and spread of early American cultures. Part 3. The Rise of Agricultural Societies The transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture represents one of the most significant developments in human history. In the Americas, this transition began around 5000 BC, when indigenous peoples in Mesoamerica and the Andes began to domesticate plants such as maize, corn, beans, squash, and potatoes. These crops became the foundation of complex agricultural societies that would eventually give rise to some of the most powerful civilizations in the Americas. The domestication of maize, in particular, had a profound impact on indigenous societies. Maize was a highly adaptable crop that could be grown in a variety of climates, and its cultivation allowed populations to grow and settle in larger, more permanent villages. In Mesoamerica, Early agricultural communities gradually evolved into complex societies with stratified social hierarchies, centralized political systems, and advanced technological innovations. One of the earliest great civilizations in the Americas was the Olmec, who flourished along the Gulf Coast of Mexico between 1400 and 400 BC. The Olmecs are often considered the mother culture of Mesoamerica, as many of the cultural and religious practices that later define the Maya and Aztec civilizations can be traced back to Olmec origins. The Olmecs were skilled architects and engineers, building large ceremonial centers and colossal stone heads that still stand today. In North America, agricultural societies also began to take root. The ancestral Puebloans, previously known as the Anasazi, who lived in the Four Corners region of the southwestern United States, developed sophisticated irrigation systems to grow crops in the arid desert. Their cliff dwellings, such as those at Mesa Verde and their kivas, ceremonial structures, reflect a complex social and religious structure. Further east, the Mississippian culture emerged around 800 CE, thriving until European contact in the 16th century. The Mississippians were skilled farmers, growing maize, beans, and squash in the fertile floodplains of the Mississippi River. They built large earthen mounds that served as platforms for temples and residences for their elite. Cahokia, located near present-day St. Louis, Missouri, was the largest city of the Mississippian culture, with a population that may have reached 20,000 at its height. The development of agriculture allowed indigenous societies to support larger populations and build more complex social structures. It also led to the creation of extensive trade networks that connected communities across vast distances. These early agricultural societies laid the groundwork for the great civilizations that would later rise in Mesoamerica and the Andes. Part 4. Complex Societies and Trade Networks By the time of European contact, indigenous peoples had established extensive trade networks that spanned the continent, connecting distant regions and facilitating the exchange of goods, ideas, and cultural practices. These trade networks were not only vital for economic survival, but they also played a key role in the spread of technological innovations, religious practices, and social hierarchies. In the Great Lakes region, the Hopewell culture, which flourished between 200 BCE and 500 CE, is one of the best examples of a society that relied heavily on long-distance trade. The Hopewell people built large, elaborate burial mounds and earthworks, some of which are still visible today. These mounds were often filled with exotic goods such as copper from the Great Lakes, obsidian from the Rocky Mountains, and shells from the Gulf of Mexico, indicating the vast reach of their trade networks. In the Southwest, the ancestral Puebloans were also part of a far-reaching trade network. They traded turquoise, pottery, and other goods with neighboring cultures in Mesoamerica. Evidence of this trade can be seen in the similarities between Puebloan architecture and that of the great Mesoamerican cities, such as Teotihuacan and Chichen Itza.
This exchange of goods and ideas helped to shape the cultural and religious practices of both regions. Trade networks were not limited to North America. In Mesoamerica, the Maya civilization developed a complex system of trade routes that connected their cities with other cultures in Central America and beyond. Maya merchants traded goods such as cacao, jade, obsidian, and textiles, which were highly prized in neighboring regions. The Maya also used their advanced knowledge of astronomy and mathematics to develop a calendar system that was adopted by other Mesoamerican civilizations. In the Andes, the Inca Empire established a vast network of roads and bridges that allowed them to control a territory that stretched from present-day Colombia to Chile. The Incas used a system of runners, known as chasquis, to carry messages and goods across their empire, ensuring efficient communication and trade. The Incas' ability to organize such a large and diverse territory was one of the keys to their success. These trade networks not only facilitated the exchange of goods, but also fostered cultural exchange. Religious ideas, artistic styles, and technological innovations spread along these routes, contributing to the development of complex societies across the Americas. The extensive trade networks of indigenous peoples are a testament to their ingenuity and adaptability, and they played a crucial role in shaping the history of the Americas. Part 5. The Flourishing of Mesoamerican Civilizations As the agricultural base strengthened, Mesoamerican civilizations blossomed into highly advanced societies with complex social, political, and religious structures. Among these were the Almecs, who are considered one of the earliest great civilizations in Mesoamerica, influencing later cultures like the Maya, Zapotec, and Aztec. The Almecs, flourishing between 1400 and 400 BC along the Gulf Coast, left behind colossal stone heads and intricate jade artifacts, representing their elite rulers. Their influence stretched across Mesoamerica through a sophisticated trade network, spreading Almec-style iconography and religious ideas. Following the Almecs, the Maya civilization became one of the most prominent and influential cultures in the region, known for their advancements in mathematics, astronomy, and writing. The Maya lived in modern-day southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and parts of Honduras and El Salvador. They constructed towering pyramids, grand palaces, and complex city-states, with important centers like Tikal, Chichen Itza, and Copan becoming powerhouses of trade and cultural development. The Maya's sophisticated calendar system, based on their detailed astronomical observations, is considered one of their greatest achievements. Their hieroglyphic writing system remains one of the most advanced of any pre-Columbian culture, and recent breakthroughs in deciphering it have revealed much about their society, including the central role of warfare, ritual sacrifice, and political alliances. The city of Teotihuacan, located near modern-day Mexico City, was another major urban center in Mesoamerica. At its peak, around 100 to 650 CE, Teotihuacan had a population of over 100,000, making it one of the largest cities in the world at the time. Its massive pyramids, such as the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon, remain iconic symbols of ancient Mesoamerican architecture. Teotihuacan's influence extended far beyond its borders, with evidence of its cultural and commercial reach found as far away as the Maya lowlands and the Zapotec city of Monte Alban. Teotihuacan's political and religious systems, as well as its urban planning and architectural styles, significantly impacted subsequent Mesoamerican cultures, including the Aztecs, who considered Teotihuacan a sacred and mythical site long after its decline. The Zapotec civilization, centered in the Oaxaca Valley, developed a hierarchical society with city-states like Monte Alban as political and religious centers. Monte Alban, which flourished from 500 BCE to 750 CE, is one of the most important archaeological sites in Mexico. The Zapotecs constructed impressive stone platforms, ball courts, and tombs, and they developed their own writing system, one of the earliest in Mesoamerica. As these Mesoamerican civilizations thrived, they built strong economic systems based on agriculture, trade, and tribute. The elite class of rulers, priests, and warriors controlled both political and religious power, while commoners, artisans, and farmers formed the backbone of society. Religion played a central role in everyday life, with gods tied to natural elements, agriculture, and the calendar. 
Rituals often included offerings and human sacrifices to appease the gods, particularly in times of drought, famine, or political instability. The rise of these Mesoamerican civilizations laid the groundwork for the later Aztec Empire, which would become the dominant force in the region by the time of European contact. The complex interactions between the various Mesoamerican cultures created a dynamic region of shared ideas, artistic styles, and religious practices, even as each society maintained its own distinct identity. Part 6. The Mississippin Mound Builders the Mississippian culture, which thrived from 800 to 1600 CE in the eastern United States, represents one of the most complex pre-Columbian societies in North America. This culture is characterized by the construction of large, earthen mounds, some of which served as platforms for temples and elite residences, while others were used for burial or ceremonial purposes. These mounds, often arranged around large central plazas, reflected the social and political hierarchies that structured Mississippian society. The largest and most well-known of the Mississippian sites is Cahokia, located near present-day St. Louis, Missouri. Cahokia reached its peak between 1050 and 1200 CE, with a population of 10,000 to 20,000 people, making it the largest urban center north of Mexico. The centerpiece of Cahokia was Monk's Mound, a massive earthen platform that rises over 100 feet high and covers 14 acres at its base. This structure likely served as the residence of the city's ruling elite and as a ceremonial center for important religious events. Cahokia's size and complexity suggest a highly stratified society, with a ruling class that controlled both political and religious authority. Archaeological evidence indicates that Cahokia's rulers oversaw an extensive network of tributary settlements, and they may have exerted influence over much of the southeastern United States. Trade networks connected Cahokia with distant regions, as evidenced by the discovery of exotic goods such as copper from the Great Lakes, shells from the Gulf of Mexico, and mica from the Appalachian Mountains. In addition to Cahokia, there were numerous other Mississippian mound-building societies scattered across the eastern United States. In the southeastern United States, the Etowah Mounds in Georgia, Moundville in Alabama, and Spiro Mounds in Oklahoma were all centers of powerful chiefdoms that controlled large territories and engaged in extensive trade. These societies were organized around a system of ranked clans or lineages, with a hereditary elite who held both religious and political power. Mississippian societies were deeply religious, and their cosmology was centered around a complex belief system that included a pantheon of gods associated with natural forces such as the sun, moon, and earth. Rituals, including feasts, sacrifices, and ceremonies conducted on the mounds, were key aspects of Mississippian religion. These rituals were often tied to agricultural cycles, particularly the cultivation of maize, which was the staple crop of Mississippian agriculture. By the time of European contact in the 16th century, many of the great Mississippian centers had declined, possibly due to a combination of environmental stress, social unrest, and the pressures of European colonization. However, the legacy of the Mississippian mound builders continued to influence indigenous societies long after their decline, and their descendants, including the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creek, maintained many of the cultural and religious traditions of their Mississippian ancestors. Part 7. The Great Plains and the Nomadic Tribes In stark contrast to the agricultural societies of Mesoamerica and the eastern woodlands, the nomadic tribes of the Great Plains developed a way of life that was centered around the vast herds of bison that roamed the region. The Plains tribes, including the Sioux, Cheyenne, Comanche, and Blackfoot, lived in a region that stretched from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains and from Canada to Texas. Their nomadic lifestyle was dictated by the seasonal migrations of the bison, which provided them with food, clothing, shelter, and tools. Before the arrival of Europeans, Plains tribes hunted bison on foot, using spears and bows and arrows. Bison were incredibly important to their survival, as nearly every part of the animal was used— the meat was dried into pemmican for food. The hides were used to make clothing and teepees, portable, cone-shaped tents, and the bones were fashioned into tools. The seasonal bison hunts were communal activities, and success in hunting often required close cooperation between different bands of a tribe. 
The arrival of horses in the 16th century, brought to the Americas by Spanish colonists, dramatically changed the way of life for the Plains tribes. Horses gave the Plains peoples greater mobility and efficiency in hunting, allowing them to follow the bison herds more effectively and hunt larger numbers of animals. The adoption of horses also led to the development of new forms of warfare and raiding, as horses became symbols of wealth and power. Tribes such as the Comanche and the Sioux became formidable military forces, using their newfound mobility to expand our territories and dominate neighboring tribes. Plain societies were organized into bands, with leadership often based on individual prowess in hunting or warfare rather than strict hereditary succession. Spiritual beliefs were deeply tied to the natural world, with the bison often playing a central role in religious ceremonies and rituals. The sun dance, a ceremonial gathering that involved fasting, dancing, and self-sacrifice, was one of the most important religious events for many Plains tribes. The sun dance was seen as a way to renew the bonds between the people and the earth, and to ensure the continued abundance of the bison. Although the nomadic way of life of the Plains tribes was radically different from the settled agricultural societies of the East and Southwest, the Plains peoples developed a rich and complex culture that emphasized community, cooperation, and a deep connection to the land. Their ability to adapt to the challenging environment of the Great Plains allowed them to thrive for centuries, even in the face of European colonization and westward expansion. Part 8. The Pacific Northwest and Coastal Societies while many indigenous societies in North America relied on agriculture or nomadic hunting, the peoples of the Pacific Northwest developed a unique way of life based on the abundance of natural resources from the ocean, rivers, and forests. The rich coastal environment of the region, which extends from Northern California through British Columbia and into Alaska, allowed for the development of complex, hierarchical societies, despite the absence of widespread agriculture. Tribes such as the Haida, Tlingit, Kwakwakawak, and Coast Salish were among those who thrived in this environment. Central to the economy of Pacific Northwest societies was the salmon, which was harvested in great quantities during annual salmon runs. The rivers of the region were teeming with salmon, which were caught using weirs, traps, and nets. Salmon was not only a primary food source, but also a valuable trade commodity. The abundance of food allowed the coastal peoples to build permanent villages, often located near the shorelines, where they constructed large wooden plank houses. These houses, some of which could accommodate extended families or multiple households, were made from the abundant cedar trees found in the region. Cedar wood was also used to craft canoes, totem poles, and elaborate carvings, which were essential to their social and ceremonial life. The Pacific Northwest tribes were known for their highly stratified social hierarchies, with a ruling class of chiefs and nobles who controlled access to resources and held significant political and religious power. Below them were commoners, who performed most of the labor, and at the bottom were slaves, who were often prisoners of war or descendants of slaves. Wealth and status were closely tied to the control of natural resources, particularly access to prime fishing and hunting locations. One of the most important cultural practices of the Pacific Northwest was the potlatch, a ceremonial feast in which leaders demonstrated their wealth and status by giving away goods, such as blankets, food, or carved items, to guests. The potlatch was a key institution for maintaining social order, redistributing wealth, and solidifying alliances between different families or villages. The ceremony often included speeches, dances, and songs, and it was a time for the public display of totem poles, which represented clan identities and histories. Totem poles, carved from massive cedar trees, are one of the most distinctive features of Pacific Northwest art and culture. These towering sculptures were often placed in front of houses or in ceremonial spaces, serving both as symbols of family lineage and as records of important events or legends. The intricate designs on totem poles depict animals such as bears, eagles, ravens, and wolves, all of which held symbolic significance in the spiritual beliefs of the coastal peoples. In addition to totem poles, the coastal peoples of the Pacific Northwest developed an impressive artistic tradition, which included elaborate masks, woven textiles, and carved objects. These art forms were closely tied to their spiritual beliefs, 
which emphasize the interconnectedness of humans, animals, and the natural world. Ceremonies and rituals often involved dances and songs that invoked the spirits of animals and ancestors, with the goal of maintaining harmony with the environment. Trade was another important aspect of life for the Pacific Northwest peoples. Canoes, which were carved from large cedar logs, were used for travel along the coast and for trading expeditions to neighboring tribes. Coastal villages traded items such as dried fish, woven baskets, and carved objects with inland groups in exchange for goods such as furs, obsidian, and copper. These trade networks connected the Pacific Northwest with other regions of North America, and they played a key role in the spread of ideas and cultural practices. The Pacific Northwest tribes were relatively isolated from European contact until the late 18th century, when Russian, Spanish, and British explorers began to arrive in the region. The fur trade, particularly the demand for sea otter pelts, quickly transformed the economy of the coastal peoples, bringing them into closer contact with European traders. However, the arrival of Europeans also brought devastating diseases such as smallpox, which decimated many coastal communities. Despite the challenges of colonization, the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest have maintained a strong cultural identity, and many continue to practice their traditional art forms and ceremonies. The potlatch, which was banned by the Canadian government in the late 19th century, was revived in the 20th century and remains an important cultural institution. Today, the peoples of the Pacific Northwest are leaders in the movement to protect the environment, particularly the salmon populations and the forests that have sustained them for millennia. Part 9. The Arrival of Europeans and Early Contact The arrival of Europeans in the Americas in the late 15th century marked the beginning of a new era for the indigenous peoples of North and South America. Although initial encounters between indigenous peoples and European explorers were often marked by curiosity and trade, these early contacts soon gave way to conflict, disease, and colonization. The first sustained European presence in the Americas began with the voyages of Christopher Columbus in 1492, followed by the Spanish conquest of the Caribbean and Mesoamerica. By the early 16th century, the Spanish had established colonies throughout the Caribbean and Central and South America, bringing them into contact with powerful indigenous civilizations like the Aztec and Inca. In North America, European colonization began more slowly, with early expeditions by Spanish explorers such as Juan Ponce de Leon in Florida, 1513, and Hernando de Soto, who led an expedition through the southeastern United States in the 1540s. French, English, and Dutch explorers followed, establishing their own colonies along the Atlantic coast and in Canada. While some European explorers, such as Samuel de Champlain, established peaceful trade relations with indigenous peoples, others sought to conquer and exploit the land and its resources. One of the most devastating consequences of European contact was the introduction of diseases such as smallpox, measles, and influenza, to which indigenous peoples had no immunity. These diseases spread rapidly through indigenous communities, often killing entire villages and weakening societies before Europeans even arrived in their territories. It is estimated that diseases brought by Europeans caused the deaths of tens of millions of indigenous people across the Americas, leading to what some historians describe as one of the largest demographic collapses in human history. Despite the catastrophic impact of disease, many indigenous groups attempted to resist European colonization. In some cases, they formed alliances with European powers to gain advantages over rival indigenous groups. For example, the Huron and Algonquin allied with the French in the 17th century, while the Iroquois Confederacy allied with the British. These alliances were often motivated by the desire to control the fur trade, which had become a key economic activity in North America by the early 17th century. The beaver pelts that were highly sought after by European traders led to increased competition and conflict between indigenous groups, as well as with European settlers. In other cases, indigenous leaders engaged in direct resistance to European encroachment. One of the most notable examples is the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, in which the Pueblo peoples of present-day New Mexico rose up against Spanish colonizers, driving them out of the region for over a decade. Similarly, in the southeastern United States, the Powhatan Confederacy, led by Chief Powhatan, resisted the expansion of English settlers in Virginia in the early 1600s, 
though ultimately the settlers prevailed. The arrival of Europeans also brought new technologies and goods to indigenous societies, such as metal tools, firearms, and horses, which had a transformative impact on their way of life. For Plains tribes, the introduction of horses by the Spanish in the 16th century revolutionized their hunting practices and allowed them to expand their territories. The horse became a symbol of wealth and power, and Plains cultures adapted their social structures and warfare strategies to take advantage of this new mobility. By the late 17th and early 18th centuries, European colonization had spread across much of North America, from the Spanish missions in California and the Southwest to the French fur trading posts in the Great Lakes and the British colonies along the Atlantic coast. While some indigenous groups managed to maintain a degree of autonomy through strategic alliances or geographical isolation, others were displaced from their ancestral lands, forced into labor, or subjected to conversion efforts by Christian missionaries. The early period of European contact was a time of immense change for indigenous peoples who faced the dual challenges of disease and colonization. However, it was also a time of adaptation and resilience, as indigenous societies found ways to resist, negotiate, and adapt to the new realities brought by European contact. Part 10. Resistance and Adaptation As European colonization progressed through the 17th and 18th centuries, indigenous peoples across the Americas faced mounting pressures from land encroachment, forced displacement, and cultural assimilation. Despite these overwhelming challenges, many indigenous groups found ways to resist European domination, either through military conflict or strategic diplomacy. This period was marked by indigenous resistance, adaptation, and survival in the face of colonization, with some groups able to maintain their sovereignty for extended periods. One of the most well-known examples of indigenous resistance in North America is the story of Tecumseh, a Shawnee leader who sought to unite the indigenous nations of the Great Lakes and Ohio Valley regions against American expansion. In the early 19th century, Tecumseh, along with his brother Tenskwatawa, known as the Prophet, formed a Pan-Indian confederation to resist the westward expansion of American settlers into indigenous territories. Tecumseh's movement was grounded in the belief that indigenous land was collectively owned by all native peoples and could not be sold or ceded without the consent of all tribes. He called for a return to traditional indigenous ways of life, rejecting European goods and cultural influences. Tecumseh's confederation gained significant momentum in the early 1810s, culminating in the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811, where U.S. forces under General William Henry Harrison defeated Tenskwatawa's forces. Despite the setback, Tecumseh continued to resist, aligning his confederation with the British during the War of 1812. Tecumseh was ultimately killed in battle in 1813, and his confederation collapsed. However, his vision of indigenous unity and resistance against European colonization had a lasting impact on indigenous political thought. The resistance to European colonization was not limited to military conflict. Indigenous peoples also engaged in strategic diplomacy to maintain their lands and way of life. In the American Southeast, the Cherokee Nation pursued a strategy of legal and cultural adaptation, adopting European-style agriculture, a written language, and a centralized government with a constitution modeled after that of the United States. This process, often referred to as civilization in the context of U.S. policy, was intended to demonstrate that the Cherokee could coexist with American settlers and govern their own lands. However, despite these efforts, the U.S. government enacted policies of removal, culminating in the infamous Trail of Tears in the 1830s, when the Cherokee, along with other southeastern tribes, were forcibly relocated to present-day Oklahoma. In the Southwest, the Pueblo people successfully resisted Spanish colonization through the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, the most successful indigenous uprising against European colonizers in North America. Led by a religious leader named Pope, the Pueblo people united to drive the Spanish out of present-day New Mexico, destroying Spanish missions and reclaiming their traditional lands. For over a decade, the Pueblos maintained their independence, though the Spanish eventually returned and re-established control in the early 1690s. Despite this, the revolt had lasting effects on the Pueblo peoples, as the Spanish adopted a more lenient approach to their governance, allowing for greater cultural and religious autonomy.
Resistance also took the form of cultural preservation. Many indigenous people sought to maintain their traditional ways of life in the face of European efforts to assimilate them into colonial society. This included the retention of languages, religious practices, and social structures. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy, for example, maintained its political and cultural integrity for centuries by carefully navigating alliances with European powers while preserving its internal governance system. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy, composed of six nations, Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora, played a crucial role in the balance of power in the northeastern colonies, often using diplomacy and military alliances to assert their autonomy. The adoption of European technologies and goods was another form of adaptation. Indigenous peoples integrated firearms, metal tools, and horses into their societies, using them to enhance their military capabilities, hunting practices, and trade networks. The introduction of horses, in particular, transformed the lives of Plains tribes like the Comanche, Sioux, and Cheyenne, who became skilled horsemen and developed highly mobile societies that could effectively resist European and American expansion. Horses allowed them to follow bison herds more efficiently, engage in long-distance trade, and conduct raids on rival tribes and European settlements. However, the pressures of European colonization also led to profound changes in indigenous social structures, economies, and spiritual beliefs. In many cases, indigenous peoples were forced to adapt to new economic realities, such as the fur trade, which brought them into closer contact with European settlers and traders. The fur trade became a central economic activity for many indigenous groups, particularly in the Great Lakes region and the Pacific Northwest, where indigenous peoples acted as intermediaries between European traders and other indigenous communities. Religion was another area where indigenous peoples both resisted and adapted to European influence. While many indigenous communities converted to Christianity, often under pressure from missionaries, they frequently blended Christian beliefs with traditional spiritual practices. This syncretism allowed indigenous peoples to preserve elements of their pre-contact religious systems while adopting aspects of Christianity. In some cases, indigenous spiritual leaders emerged who preached a return to traditional ways and resistance to European encroachment, as seen with figures like the prophet Tenskwatawa and Neelan, the Delaware prophet, whose visions inspired Pontiac's rebellion in 1763. In summary, the period of European colonization was one of both resistance and adaptation for the indigenous peoples of the Americas. While many indigenous nations fought to defend their lands and sovereignty through military conflict, others pursued diplomacy and cultural adaptation as strategies for survival. Despite the overwhelming challenges posed by disease, displacement, and assimilation, indigenous peoples found ways to maintain their cultural identity, preserve their traditions, and resist the pressures of colonization. Part 11. The Trail of Tears and Forced Removal The 19th century marked one of the darkest periods in the history of indigenous peoples in North America as the U.S. government pursued a policy of forced removal, displacing thousands of Native Americans from their ancestral lands. The most infamous example of this policy is the Trail of Tears, during which the Cherokee, along with the Muscogee, Creek, Seminole, Chickasaw, and Choctaw nations, were forcibly relocated from their homelands in the southeastern United States to Indian Territory in present-day Oklahoma. This forced migration was part of the U.S. government's broader Indian removal policy, which sought to clear indigenous lands for American settlers. The origins of the Indian removal policy can be traced back to the early 19th century, when increasing pressure from white settlers to acquire indigenous lands led to conflict between indigenous nations and the U.S. government. President Andrew Jackson, a staunch advocate of removal, signed the Indian Removal Act into law in 1830, authorizing the federal government to negotiate treaties with indigenous nations for the exchange of their lands east of the Mississippi River for territory in the West. Despite legal resistance from indigenous nations, including the Cherokee, who took their case to the U.S. Supreme Court in Worcester v. Georgia, 1832, the U.S. government proceeded with the removal policy. In 1838, under the supervision of the U.S. military, Thousands of Cherokee were forcibly rounded up and marched westward on what became known as the Trail of Tears. The journey was brutal, 
with thousands dying from disease, exposure, and starvation along the way. It is estimated that around 4,000 Cherokee, nearly a quarter of their population, died during the forced relocation. The Cherokee were not the only indigenous nation to suffer under the policy of forced removal. The Muscogee, Seminole, Chickasaw, and Choctaw nations also endured similar hardships as they were forced to leave their lands in the southeast and resettle in Indian territory. These forced migrations devastated indigenous communities, breaking apart families, disrupting social structures, and severing their deep connections to the land. The policy of forced removal was not limited to the southeastern United States. In the Midwest, the Sauk and Fox nations, led by Chief Black Hawk, resisted U.S. efforts to remove them from their lands in Illinois, resulting in the Black Hawk War of 1832. The war ended in defeat for the indigenous forces, and the U.S. government proceeded with their removal to lands west of the Mississippi River. Similar removals took place throughout the Midwest and the Southern Plains, as the U.S. government continued its westward expansion at the expense of indigenous nations. The impact of the Trail of Tears and forced removal on indigenous peoples was profound. In addition to the immediate loss of life, the removals led to the breakdown of traditional governance structures as indigenous nations struggled to rebuild their societies in unfamiliar and often hostile environments. The removal policy also set the stage for further conflicts between indigenous peoples and the U.S. government in the decades to come, as the westward expansion of American settlers continued to encroach on indigenous lands. Despite the immense hardships of the Trail of Tears and other forced removals, many indigenous nations were able to rebuild their communities in Indian territory. The Cherokee, in particular, reestablished their government, schools, and cultural institutions, demonstrating remarkable resilience in the face of adversity. However, the legacy of the Trail of Tears remains a painful chapter in the history of indigenous peoples, a reminder of the long history of dispossession and displacement that they have endured. Part 12, Survival and Revival in the Modern Era. The 20th and 21st centuries have been marked by both struggle and resurgence for indigenous peoples across the Americas. In the early 20th century, Indigenous peoples faced continued marginalization, discrimination, and efforts to erase their cultural identities. Many indigenous children were forced into government-run boarding schools, where they were prohibited from speaking their languages or practicing their traditions. These schools, often operated by Christian missionaries, sought to assimilate indigenous children into mainstream American and Canadian society, but the effects of these policies were devastating, leaving lasting scars on indigenous communities. Despite these challenges, the modern era has also seen a cultural and political revival among indigenous peoples. Beginning in the mid-20th century, indigenous activists and leaders began to organize for greater recognition of their rights, sovereignty, and cultural heritage. The American Indian Movement, AM, founded in 1968, was a key force in the struggle for indigenous rights in the United States. AGM activists organized protests, such as the occupation of Alcatraz Island in 1969 and the occupation of Wounded Knee in 1973, to draw attention to the plight of indigenous peoples and demand justice for historical wrongs. In Canada, the Idle No More movement, which began in 2012, has also become a powerful voice for indigenous rights, particularly in relation to environmental issues and the protection of indigenous lands. Indigenous leaders and activists in both the U.S. and Canada have been at the forefront of environmental movements, advocating for the protection of water, forests, and wildlife in accordance with traditional indigenous beliefs about the interconnectedness of all living things. Language revitalization efforts have also become a central focus of modern indigenous movements. Across the Americas, indigenous languages that were once on the brink of extinction are being taught to new generations of indigenous youth, ensuring that these languages, along with the cultural knowledge they carry, are preserved for the future. The late 20th and early 21st centuries have also seen a renewed emphasis on indigenous sovereignty and self-governance. In the United States, the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act of 1975 gave indigenous nations greater control over their own affairs, allowing them to manage their own schools, health services, and economic development initiatives. In Canada, 
the recognition of indigenous land claims, along with the 1999 creation of Nunavut, a self-governing Inuit territory, marked significant steps toward indigenous self-determination. Indigenous peoples have also achieved remarkable successes in the arts, literature, and politics. Indigenous authors, such as Louise Erdrich, Sherman Alexie, and Thomas King, have gained international acclaim for their works, which explore the complexities of indigenous identity and history. Indigenous visual artists and filmmakers have also made significant contributions to the global art scene, using their work to challenge stereotypes and celebrate indigenous culture. Today, indigenous peoples continue to face significant challenges, including poverty, health disparities, and the ongoing effects of colonialism. However, the resilience and determination of indigenous nations, combined with growing public awareness of indigenous rights, have led to significant progress in recent decades. Indigenous leaders are playing an increasingly prominent role in national and international politics, and the voices of indigenous peoples are being heard in debates over environmental policy, human rights, and cultural preservation. The story of the indigenous peoples of the Americas is one of survival, resistance, and renewal. Despite centuries of colonization, displacement, and cultural erasure, indigenous peoples have maintained their identities, their traditions, and their connections to the land. As they continue to fight for their rights and reclaim their histories, they are not only preserving the legacy of their ancestors, but also shaping the future of their nations for generations to come. Part 13. Cultural Renaissance and Language Revitalization In the latter half of the 20th century, indigenous communities across the Americas began to experience a powerful cultural renaissance. After centuries of attempts to suppress indigenous identities, a resurgence of traditional practices, art forms, and languages became central to reclaiming indigenous heritage. In this period, indigenous peoples worked diligently to reverse the losses inflicted by colonization, the boarding school system, and policies of forced assimilation. One of the most significant efforts has been language revitalization. Many indigenous languages, once at risk of extinction due to decades of suppression, are now being actively preserved and taught to younger generations. These efforts range from community language classes to immersive schools where indigenous languages are the primary mode of instruction. The Cherokee Nation, for example, has developed immersion schools to teach children the Cherokee language from an early age. Similarly, the native Hawaiian language has seen a resurgence through initiatives like the Ahapu Nana Leo schools, which have successfully educated generations of Hawaiian-speaking children. The revitalization of languages is more than just the recovery of words and grammar. It is a reawakening of cultural identity. Language is deeply connected to cultural traditions, oral histories, and spiritual beliefs. The return of languages to indigenous communities has helped to restore a sense of pride and continuity with the past. In addition, indigenous artists, musicians, and writers have contributed to this cultural renaissance by producing works that reflect both their traditional heritage and contemporary indigenous experiences. Artistic expression has always been a crucial element of indigenous cultures, and in the modern era, Many indigenous artists have drawn on traditional motifs while addressing current social and political issues. Visual artists like Norval Morisot, Anishinaabe, and contemporary artists like Jeffrey Gibson, Choctaw Cherokee, blend traditional art forms with modern techniques, creating powerful visual statements about identity, survival, and resilience. The revival of traditional crafts, from beadwork to basket weaving, has allowed artists to pass these skills on to new generations while creating a market for indigenous arts both locally and globally. Similarly, indigenous authors have used literature as a means to explore and assert their cultural identities. Writers like Louise Erdrich, Ojibwe, Sherman Alexie, Spokane Kerr Delane, and Anne Scott Mamaday, Kiowa, have gained critical acclaim for their works, which delve into the complexities of indigenous life, including the enduring effects of colonization, cultural survival, and contemporary indigenous experiences. These voices have brought indigenous stories to the forefront of literature, educating both indigenous and non-indigenous readers alike about the richness and diversity of native cultures. Part 14. Indigenous Leadership in Environmental Protection Indigenous peoples have long held a deep and sacred connection to the natural world, with environmental stewardship forming a core part of many indigenous belief systems. 
In the modern era, indigenous leaders have emerged as key figures in global movements for environmental justice and sustainability. Recognizing that the health of the earth is intrinsically tied to the well-being of their communities, indigenous activists and leaders advocate for the protection of natural resources, sacred lands, and biodiversity. In many cases, indigenous peoples are at the forefront of efforts to combat the effects of climate change and to protect ecosystems that are under threat from industrial development. One prominent example is the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe's opposition to the Dakota Access Pipeline, DAPL, in 2016. The proposed pipeline, which would run near the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota, was seen as a threat to both water sources and sacred land. The Water is Life movement, led by the Standing Rock Sioux, galvanized indigenous and non-indigenous supporters alike, raising awareness about the dangers of pipelines and other forms of resource extraction. Though the pipeline was ultimately completed, the movement sparked an international conversation about indigenous rights and environmental justice. Similarly, in the Amazon rainforest, indigenous groups have been leading efforts to halt deforestation and the encroachment of oil companies into protected areas. The rainforest, which is often referred to as the lungs of the earth, plays a critical role in regulating the global climate. Indigenous peoples in the Amazon have formed alliances and advocacy groups to push back against illegal logging, mining, and drilling which threaten both the environment and their ways of life. By asserting their territorial rights, indigenous peoples help protect the biodiversity of the Amazon while preserving their cultural practices. In Canada, the fight for environmental protection has been championed by indigenous leaders as well. For instance, the Wet'suwet'en 10 Nation has resisted the construction of the coastal gas link pipeline across their unceded territory in British Columbia. This resistance has drawn attention to broader issues of indigenous sovereignty and the right to make decisions about land use without outside interference. Indigenous knowledge, often referred to as traditional ecological knowledge, TK, is increasingly recognized as vital in addressing modern environmental challenges. TK encompasses the wisdom gained from thousands of years of living in balance with the land and has proven invaluable in understanding sustainable agricultural practices, forest management, and water conservation. In collaboration with scientists, indigenous leaders are working to integrate TK into conservation strategies, demonstrating that indigenous worldviews offer solutions to some of the most pressing environmental problems of our time. Part 15. Looking to the Future – indigenous sovereignty and global impact. The path forward for indigenous peoples is one of continued resilience, adaptation, and leadership. While many challenges remain, such as poverty, health disparities, and the ongoing effects of historical trauma, indigenous communities are pushing for greater self-determination and sovereignty over their lands, resources, and political futures. The recognition of indigenous sovereignty is critical for ensuring that native nations can govern themselves according to their own laws, customs, and beliefs, free from external control. In the United States and Canada, there have been significant strides in recognizing indigenous rights. Treaties signed in the past, often violated by colonial governments, are now being revisited in legal battles to reclaim land and resources. Indigenous nations have won key legal victories, such as the 2020 U.S. Supreme Court ruling in McGirt v. Oklahoma, which reaffirmed that much of eastern Oklahoma remains Native American land under treaties signed with the U.S. government. These legal battles have broader implications for indigenous sovereignty and the right to manage natural resources. Internationally, indigenous movements are gaining visibility and influence. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP, adopted in 2007, provides a framework for the protection of indigenous rights, including land ownership, cultural preservation, and the right to participate in decision-making processes that affect them. While the declaration is non-binding, it represents a significant step toward global recognition of indigenous issues and has been used as a tool by indigenous activists to advocate for their rights on an international stage. In addition to legal and political victories, indigenous peoples are making their mark in various fields, including science, technology, the arts, and entrepreneurship. Indigenous scientists and engineers are increasingly contributing to fields like environmental science, astronomy, and medical research, often drawing on both Western scientific methods and traditional knowledge. 
Indigenous entrepreneurs are building businesses that not only create economic opportunities for their communities, but also prioritize sustainability and cultural preservation. The future of Indigenous peoples will be shaped by their ongoing commitment to sovereignty, culture, and environmental protection. Indigenous youth, who are reclaiming their languages, traditions, and roles as leaders, will play a pivotal role in this future. With their voices at the forefront of global discussions about human rights and the environment, Indigenous peoples are not only working to heal the wounds of the past, but are also forging new paths toward a future that honors their heritage while addressing the challenges of the modern world. Thank you for joining us on this exploration of the Indigenous people of America. We hope you have gained new insights into their incredible history, culture, and resilience. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share to stay connected with us as we continue uncovering more fascinating stories. See you next time.